Good afternoon, Japan. You are tuned in to AFN Tokyo Studio for our special broadcast, our exclusive broadcast of the Facebook Town Hall with United States Forces Japan Commander Lieutenant General Sam Angelella and also USFJ Command Chief Master Sergeant James Laurent. And I just want to welcome everybody, our listeners all over Japan, for our special broadcast. And uh, thank you, too, for sitting down with us today. Yeah, thanks, Kellen. You know, the most important thing that I can do is uh, talk to our service members and their families. And so uh, thanks for the opportunity here uh, and giving me, giving me uh, some time on the air. I also want to have a shout out to everybody on uh, AFN Misawa, AFN Tokyo, AFN Sasebo, AFN Iwakuni, and uh, AFN Okinawa. I know, I hope everybody's out there listening. Most definitely, sir. And uh, we got a lot of questions for you that uh, we received on the USFJ Facebook page, and we'll be getting to those here in a moment. So, listeners, please stay tuned right after this musical break. All right, we're back here in the AFN Tokyo studio. I'm Senior Airman Kellen Carr, and also joined by the United States Forces Japan Commander, Lieutenant General Sam Angelella, and USFJ Command Chief Master Sergeant James Laurent. And, uh, sir, before we get to the Facebook Town Hall questions, I um, understand you have some opening statements for us. Yeah, there's just a couple of things I want to say. You know, we, we've been uh, watching the questions come in on Facebook, and obviously we're not going to be able to answer them all today, and, and so we've got them grouped into a couple of different groups and, and we'll talk about those. But you know, the first thing I want to do is thank everybody. I, I know you don't hear it enough, but personally I want to thank each and every one of you for your efforts that we have out here day in and day out. You may not directly see the impacts of your efforts, but I do. I see it uh, in the success across all the services. Uh, I see it in the interactions with our uh, Japanese counterparts. There's really a lot to be proud of. I really uh, want to thank everybody, and I really appreciate everything you do. You know, unfortunately, as, as we talk about, uh, there's a lot of distractions out there, and it gets a lot of the media attention. And uh, it tends to take the focus away from all the good things that you all accomplish out there. One of those uh, that is a very terrible distraction is the sexual assaults within our ranks. and uh, but. We have some great sexual assault prevention and response efforts, and uh, it's really, really high on our priorities. You know, sexual assault's a crime, and it's a contradiction to everything we stand for as service members and uh, as members of the community. So I expect our military out there and our family members uh, to know that uh, we need to act appropriately and, and take the right action. And so uh, if they're not, then those that uh, break the law are going to be held accountable in accordance with the UCMJ. So, you know, enough on that right now. But another subject that we, I get asked a lot of questions about, of course, is uh, the, the liberty policy and, uh, and the curfew. And so, you know, ultimately, each one of us is the author of the policy. And so I recognize that uh, a vast majority of the folks out there are, are, you know, outstanding service members, outstanding family members, and uh, representatives of our country here in Japan. But uh, uh, we also need to realize that the leadership out there understands the great things that you're doing. The incidents are down. Uh, we just had a recent report from Okinawa that said the incidents off base are, are the lowest that they've been since 1972. You know, and I, I was actually talking to Admiral Locklear about this. And, and some people might say, well, that's because we have everybody locked up. That's not really the case. You know, everybody's not locked up. And, and in fact, it's because of the leadership and the understanding of each of the service's core values that, that people are acting appropriately and they're taking care of each other when they're out there. So, uh, you know, those that, that break the rules, we're, we'll hold them accountable. We'll hold them accountable uh, amongst ourselves. And that's the kind of leadership that I'm uh, looking for. You know, the chief just finished a long tour uh, through Japan with all the senior enlisted leaders of the services. And so uh, I think you might have a couple of things to say about that too, a little bit of feedback. Yes, sir. Just as you said, sir, uh, I spent a lot of time, uh, I took uh, Command Master Chief Lutz from PACOM out to Okinawa. Uh, we swung through there, uh, saw a bunch of uh, different groups that we talked to, and then we went on down to Sasebo and then Yakuska. And then I, I spent uh, a little bit of time up in Masala this past week. and. So I got to talk to a whole bunch of different groups. A lot of people have some really good ideas, and, and we continue to talk about different things, sir. And, and as we, uh, we look at the policies and, and what they are right now, 
we, we talk through those ideas and try to come up with what's the best way ahead to, to go. You're, you're absolutely right. There's been a lot of successes um, in the way the policy is written, and, and I think that we'll continue on to, uh, to make sure that the policy is best for our service members. Yeah, let, let's, talk, let's talk about some of the positive things that have happened. You know, uh, it's really near and dear to my heart how we cooperate with our Japanese hosts. You know, for example, uh, Kadena recently opened its gates to support the Okinawa Marathon. More than 13,000 runners uh, ran through the base as part of the event in February, and more than 450 base volunteers came out in support. You know, before that, there was the annual frostbite run here right at Yokota. More than 10,000 runners converged on the base. Uh, on March 30th, the Navy is going to host the Yokosuka Spring Festival. Uh, Camp Zama is going to open their base for the Cherry Blossom Festival on April 5th. Uh, and there's just so many things going on. All the events, numerous others uh, in the coming months, really special to me and all the service members and families uh, who have that you know, distinct privilege and pleasure of living uh, here in Japan. Okay, so I guess that's probably enough uh, uh, of me uh, uh, bragging on all the great things you're doing out there. Let's go ahead and, uh, and turn it back over to you. All right, sir. Well, as you were stating in your comments, you know, a big thing on everyone's mind is uh, definitely the liberty policy. And people were asking, you know, a wide range of things like, you know, or is it going to change a little bit or can, she, can we change this aspect of it? Or when is it going to go away in, in its entirety? So uh, let's basically just summarize and say, uh, is the liberty policy or aspects of the uh, Okinawa res Okinawan restrictions, um, are they going to change anytime soon? And if not, why? Well, you know, like the chief said, well, we talk about this just about uh, each and every day, and um, uh, I experienced it myself when I went to visit uh, Okinawa. You know, I, I went down to Okinawa on leave, and I understood, you know, the the restriction of only being able to have two drinks uh, with dinner off base. And so I continue to talk to the Okinawa leadership. One of the things that we have to realize is that uh, when I am doing negotiations. Uh, for the good things for our service members, for force structure changes, for upgrades, for training ranges. Uh, uh, I have to be able to go into those negotiations knowing that we're going to concentrate on that and not some unfortunate incident uh, th that happened uh, because maybe someone uh, had a little bit too much to drink uh, and uh, did something inappropriate off base or even broke the law, committed a crime. So, you know, right now the, it's not going to change in the immediate future. Uh, I don't see a time in the near future when it would go away completely. You know, it really is, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to watch ourselves, uh, to be good wingmen, good shipmates, good battle buddies out there and, uh, and take care of each other out in the community. Uh, I think everybody realizes that, you know, uh, uh, you can really uh, – experience the culture of Japan and get to know your Japanese neighbors and not have to do that after midnight or, you know, drinking after midnight or, or going around the streets outside the base uh, in the middle of the night. Y you can do that with the programs that we have and uh, get to know your Japanese counterparts. So, you know, I, I leave it to, to ourselves, uh, to the young leaders out there. Uh, I'm not immune to your good uh, suggestions. The chief and I were just talking about this this morning after his trip back uh, from Japan. So uh, we talk about it each and every day. I understand. Uh, I, I see it more as an inconvenience, but then uh, it's a convenience for me and General O'Donnell and the other senior leaders as we go into these joint committee meetings negotiating with the govern government of Japan to be able to focus on the mission and the good things that happen. Now, along those same lines, sir, like People are saying there's, there almost seems to be a, a blanket coverage for those who go on these uh, FSS trips, you know, whether they depart or they arrive um, during curfew hours. Now, is that also applied to chauffeured vans and uh, contracted uh, vehicles through FSS? Yeah, well, the first thing I want to say is, you know, I am a big supporter of all the services programs, uh, of all of the services. I've, I've taken... Uh, some of the FSS trips to go skiing, snowboarding. Uh, uh, they have some great uh, golf outings in the spring. And uh, sometimes there's a lot of travel. And so you're going to get back past midnight. And, uh, and so there's no blanket waiver for that. Uh, but I think, you know, the 05 commanders in the change of command with, uh, with the recommendations of their uh, senior enlisted 
uh, are going to be able to waive uh, people to go on those trips. And so you would need that kind of special permission also for uh, the FSS vans and such. Uh, there's nothing automatic, and, and really it's an awareness thing. Uh, I, I expect the, uh, the NCOs and the commanders to understand what their uh, young service members are doing, what their needs are, and, and by asking permission to stay out late on these trips or to visit orphanages, other things around Japan, getting to know the place, uh, we'll be able to focus our leadership a little bit better. Yes, sir. Well, stay tuned, listeners. We're going to have more from General Angelella and Chief Laurent. After we take a short musical break, we'll be covering some uh, other topics, including improving services on base like cable and Internet. We're back here in the AFN Tokyo studio for our exclusive Facebook town hall meeting with Lieutenant General Sam Angelella and Chief Laurent. Now, we covered base liberty. That's the big one on everyone's mind. But the second largest one, the one we got the second most uh, amount of questions about, had to do with the table or telephone, cable, and Internet services on bases. You know, uh, many people talking about data capping and the hindrance it caused for those who are doing online schooling. Um, is there anything that's going to improve the services uh, for individuals on base or uh, possibly some kind of competition for the services that are being provided for those on base? Well, Kellen, before we jump into that one, I just want to make a comment about the Liberty Program, if that's okay. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that I found as I, as I was circulating through the command is, there's, as, as General said, there's a lot of leadership influence that's going on out there, and we're doing a great job with that, and that's why our incidents are low, as low as they are. And, and one of the things that I, that I questions that I asked folks as I went around is, if you see somebody and you're out and about and you're doing things and you see somebody and, or they get in trouble and you look at them and you, you say to yourself, yeah, I knew that was coming. It was just a matter of time or, or you saw that one coming or something like that. Those are the folks that I need you to use your influence on, regardless of what rank you are. Make sure that you're out there, you're, you're, you're grabbing them by the collars and you're pulling them out of the bars or wherever they are that they're really kind of pushing that edge. They're maybe not getting in trouble yet, but you see that they're on the edge. Use your leadership. Pull them back. And that's what I think we're pretty successful at right now is doing that. And it protects the character of the uniform. It protects the character of all of our service members here in, in representing the United States while we're here in Japan. So I think that's really important. I think that's why we've been so successful, because our leaders are doing that. Again, no matter what rank they are, they're doing that. And I think that's very important for us. So Most definitely, Chief. You make a great point. And uh, again, we are ambassadors while we're here in Japan. So we need to always be uh, mindful of that. So. Um, Again, back to the second question we're talking about, uh, improving <laughs> Internet services and uh, uh, quality on base. Is there going to be any kind of competition um, you know, to kind of maybe bring down those prices and, and get better bang for your buck, so to speak? Yeah, you know, I, I learn more and more about this uh, every day. And, of course, you know, we're all Internet users, and uh, a lot of our listeners are out there listening to AFN radio uh, through the Internet right now. And, and that takes bandwidth and data, and, uh, and so... I, we did a little bit of homework on this. As, as you might know, the availability of these services is contracted through uh, the exchange programs, and the particulars of those contracts are negotiated by the exchange uh, on behalf of our people. Now, we have people, uh, airmen and, and service members, that sit on the AFES exchange board, and, and we can talk about this in the future, but these changes, they don't, they don't take place overnight. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, my many assignments in Japan, uh, we have come a long way in our electronic capabilities and, uh, and, and limitations. And, and uh, I, know, I know we're not right there yet. I'm not as familiar with the issues and problems uh, that have been raised, but I've been informed, you know, that Allied Telesis uh, is reworking the network infrastructure to uh, provide better services and pricing. So, um, you know, pro part of the problem is the previous contract was geared mostly towards uh, television services because, you know, the chief and I, that's, mm -hmm. that's what we wanted right. when we were younger. And so, uh, but, you, but you all want uh, more uh, bandwidth, more internet, uh, more internet access. So uh, right now, I, I, I don't think there's plans to provide another uh, provider, but, uh, um, you know, the, the, the contract that Allied Telesis has does give them exclusive rights on base, but, uh, you know, they are t working to improve it. The, the, like I said, the improvements won't be here tomorrow, but uh, they're on the way. They're on the way. You know, those exclusive rights, I think that as, as that process went through, they were, not, they, they were bid against other, other companies to be able to get those exclusive rights. So it wasn't that they, they alone were given those rights. They actually bid against other companies to be able to get that. And, 
part of that contract was building up the infrastructure and doing other things that was pretty expensive uh, investment for them to do. And as the general said, same with me, I, I've been at Kadena, Masao, and now Tokyo, and the internet services that we've had across the command have improved quite a bit. What we need to do is we need to make sure that as you have problems with the internet or whatever those issues are, make sure you're collecting the data to be able to show that you can't just come say, uh, you know, I, I'm not being able to watch, I, I can't watch all the movies I want to watch. How many movies are you able to watch before you run out of bandwidth or before you run out of the gigabytes and those types of things so we can provide some facts back to them and maybe they can make some adjustments to it as they look at the contract. Yeah, the talent that you all have is pretty amazing to me I, that you're able to, you know, uh, watch a movie, uh, you know, do some other work and, and, you know, maybe work online for internet classes. I know that the uh, parents uh, do a lot of online schooling, and so uh, to get all that stuff to work at the same time is pretty impressive. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, you know how that talent will pay back again later. Multitasking so, at a yeah. whole new level. Pretty amazing. <laughs> pretty amazing. It most definitely is. And uh, on a different subject, we also received a question. Um, another big thing, obviously, on many service members' minds: the uh, sequestration and drawdowns. Uh, one person stated that manpower and resources, as they're diminishing, the workflow. Um, is not slowing down. Um, case in point, the legal or um, our process for handling UCMJ Article 120 cases is becoming more complex and requiring more man hours and uh, budget per case. Um, this is an example is happening all over the military. At the same time, political leaders are calling for pay and benefit reductions. So uh, stating that we are overpaid and underdeserving according to a recent Time article. Uh, there are too many questions in all, so I'll just ask you for your view on whatever triggers uh, in your mind. Well, there's, there's kind of two questions uh, in, in the opening there, and, and we put a lot of these together with, uh, from what we heard from our listeners out there. The first thing is, you know, if we're going to talk about Article 120, sexual assault, I, I want to reiterate what I said in my opening statement. You know, everybody out there knows sexual assault is a crime, and uh, I implore you to do the right thing, intervene when you can, and uh, uh, the vast, vast majority of our uh, service members, family members, uh, really upstanding, great Americans. Uh, with respect to um, what America thinks of us and our uh, political leaders and our citizens back home, I'll tell you, you know, you all are the top 1%. And uh, uh, I was recently talking to Admiral Locklear about this also, you know, and, and he went to the Hill and testified on our behalf, on behalf of mine and your. Uh, uh, benefits and, and compensation. And so, you know, only the top 20 percent of high school graduates even qualify to join our military service, your military service. And then, and then only the top 1 percent choose to volunteer. So you're like the top 1 percent. And so uh, these compensation packages, uh, our political leaders, you know, th they understand that. And, and they they support that. You know, uh, Secretary Hagel, uh, former U.S. Senator, uh, in, his, in his budget statement, he talked about that and, uh, and making sure that we get the compensation that we, uh, that we signed up for. And Chief. You know, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, Chief. Chief. I, I was just going to say, I, I kind of caught on to what you said, sir, about compensation <laughs> because there's a lot of times we term it as entitlements, and really it's not entitlements. It's compensation for some very tough work that we expect out of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and coast guardsmen throughout the command. And so uh, that, that, that terminology is pretty important for us, and I think that that's uh, uh, something that we got to keep voicing our opinions on and keep, keep uh, pushing forward on. The, uh, the, the impact of the force shaping programs, the various force shaping programs throughout uh, all of our services is going to be tough. It's, it's going to be a leadership challenge throughout this time. It takes a lot of trust in the leadership that at the senior levels of each of our services or all of our services and at the DOD that they're making the right decisions. Um, with the with the cards that are handed to them, with the with the budget and constraints and the different things that they have to have, and, and sometimes it's hard to hard to maintain that trust, but we we still we we have to have that. You Most know, ha having said that, you know we do face uh, fiscal reality where we're going to have to get smaller, and uh, it's going to require all the services to shape their respective forces given the current uh, budget constraints. You know, as General Welsh, the Air Force Chief of Staff, recently said, there's no more easy cuts. And uh, every major decision ref reflected in the budget proposal uh, f for now and the out years is going to hurt. 
you know, I understand there's a lot of uncertainty out there. It's a, it's a challenge for leadership across the board to ensure we make the programs and decisions uh, as transparent as possible. So, you know, you all, our people, can make informed decisions uh, about, about the future. The SECDEF recently testified before Congress about the budget. Uh, he emphasized his commitment, like I said, to providing service members our fair compensation as well uh, as the training and tools. You know, when I talk to young airmen uh, as I go out and about the command, I say, okay, well, who signed up for an education? Okay, and a lot of people do that. We all sign up for an education. I signed up for an education uh, way back when in, uh, you know, 1977. And so then I ask, hey, who has time to, to get that education that you dreamed about? And am, um, am I and your leaders giving you the time and the tools to do that? So we're paying attention to that. Uh, all these cuts, you know, are going to come at a cost. Uh, we're really uh, balancing our readiness uh, we are trying to remain focused on the family programs and, uh, and service member programs. Uh, next year's budget, I believe, uh, there's a 1% pay raise for everybody uh, except uh, for general and flag officers. Uh, the, that pay has been frozen, and uh, uh, I think it is a fair compromise you know, to keep some of the other programs going. So very tough questions. Again, I talked about how talented you all are, so I, I know you're going to be able to make it through this. One of, the, one of the best lines I've heard on, on the, the thought going into this is from General Carlisle, the PACAF commander, and he says he has a moral obligation to provide Senior Airman Carr the best Air Force in the future um, under the constraints that he has so that when you're Chief Master Sergeant Carr or you're Chief Master Sergeant Sachs, we provide you the best Air Force that we possibly can. And I think all the service chiefs are under that belief. And for me, I take it pretty personally, and I hold him accountable for that whenever I have the opportunity to talk to him because I've got Airman Basic Laurent, my son, who's in basic training right now in his fourth week of basic training, and I expect that for the next six years that he's serving, that we're going to have the best Air Force we possibly can under the constraints that we have, and, and I trust that they have that capability to provide that for us. Hey, you mentioned uh, General Carlisle, our PACAF commander, and uh, this, this just in, and uh, I don't even know if these people know this or not, but he just uh, recently sent me an, a note about the PACAF 2014 outstanding airmen of the year that are going to compete at uh, headquarters air force and out of the four uh, two of them are here in japan so big shout out to uh, the first sergeant of the year senior master sergeant harper in the 18th equipment maintenance squadron at kadena and uh and the airman of the year senior airman hawk uh, of the 374th civil engineering squadron yakota air base here right here at uh, at yakota i hope you're all listening if not i know your squadron mates are congratulations that's well awesome done news. <laughs> definitely congratulations to them and uh also a related question came in dealing with uh civilian employees uh one person asked uh why is it they're only allowed to serve two consecutive contracts on Kadena. Uh, from his understanding he said a lot of people don't want to come here because of the overwhelming amount of rules uh, and he'd like to know why he can't stay past four years because he's single and his, his max out time is actually eight years. Yeah this is a tough one. Uh, it, it doesn't just affect Kadena but all the services uh, in Japan you know we're feeling it at the headquarters as well. I've got uh, some uh, civilians uh, that have been here for many, many years. They have great contacts, uh, and they really make, make it happen for us. The issue uh, comes down to federal regulations that have, been, that have been placed for years, and now in the, in the fiscal requirements, uh, we're, we're getting some new guidance, and uh, uh, we're, we're looking at how, how to follow uh, the federal regulations uh, uh, as we're supposed to. You know, the theory behind the rules is it allows uh, others to compete for these opportunities to come overseas. You know, like I said, uh, the top 1% volunteers, well, that's true in the civilian workforce, too. They volunteer to come over here, and uh, uh, some of our uh, civilians feel that they don't have the opportunity to come over uh, overseas because uh, the jobs aren't there. Uh, I'm in negotiations right now to see, you know, what the balance is uh, in the Air Force side, at least, uh, on how to, uh, you know, uh, help out those folks that have commitments over here and, and also preserve some of the opportunities for other uh, civilians to come over. I'd love to be able to unilaterally extend everybody, uh, 
uh, but it's not my decision to make, and it really is a real, uh, it's a corporate DOD decision. So, Your thoughts on that, Chief? Yeah, no, I just agree with the boss on that one. That's a tough, really tough one for us to do, and we, we're trying to watch it as best we can and manage the civilian workforce the best we can, but it's, uh, it's a tough one to handle. All right, well, listeners, stay tuned. We're going to have more. we got a question from a, a Marine down in Okinawa wanting to know about the Green Line. We're also going to talk about etiquette in our base schools, so stay tuned for more after this short musical break. All right, thanks. We're back here in the Eagle a a a AFN Tokyo studio. I'm Senior Airman Kellen Gar, and it's our Facebook town hall with USFJ Commander Lieutenant General Sam Angelella and Chief Laurent, James Laurent. And uh, we're back, and we've been talking about base liberty. We've talked about uh, the changing of the standards as far as Internet and stuff on base. Um, now we have a Marine down in Okinawa who has a question about the Green Line. I know not everyone in Japan is going to be familiar with the Green Line, but it, uh, he said, how come the Green Line only runs through United States Marine Corps bases? Um, as such, Marines from Camps Schwab and Hansen do not get afforded the opportunity to go to Kadena without a high taxi fare. He said a Green Line route on the weekends to Kadena would help those Marines out. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know the real answer for that, and so uh, I'm going to have to do some more homework, but it's more of an internal uh, Marine Corps uh, Japan issue. boils down to that, you know, the service, uh, what, what the service is for. It's provide mission essential transportation, like you mentioned, between uh, the camps for the Marines on the island, and uh, being able to provide space A transportation is a secondary benefit. And so um, there's rules and regulations that government uh, or that govern the use of this government uh, equipment, and we're prohibited from providing services like that, uh, you know, what you're describing when there's commercially available uh, services, even if, uh, uh, you know, the result is the high taxi fare. So uh, I'll check with uh, MCI PAC down in Okinawa and see you know, if, if there are other collateral services that some of the other services are going to provide. But, uh, you know, I, that's going to take a little more homework. I do know I, when I was down in Okinawa, I did talk to Sergeant Major Williamson from MCI PAC, the uh, command SEL, and uh, he did say he's looking at the, uh, the green line just because of uh, uh, the lack of availability for folks. There's a lot of people waiting in line when it's time to come back, and so he was looking at it. So something on his mind, too. So I can, I can run that one up to him again, sir, and, and work on that. Okay. Hey, oh. can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's, it's mustache mark. <laughs> and so I, uh, I noticed that you have a nice, trim, you know, sharp-looking mustache on there. Uh, is that, are you a mustache march guy, or are you year-round just no, keeping sir, within regs there? This is mustache march. I actually almost shaved this off, you know, knowing I was doing this interview with you. Yeah. I was sitting there, I'm asking a uh, station manager. I said, sir, should I, should I shave this off? And he said, well, surely, you know, it's mustache march. You won't mind. And then you came in here with a very nice mustache yourself, and also Chief Laurent. <laughs> so, so who's got the better mustache, the chief or the, the general? Who's, who, who's well, that? Oh, I'm the just curious chief. as to who might have that. You, didn't, you all didn't see that out there. The chief just paid him to say that the chief's mustache is nicer. I, I, I haven't, I haven't so. said a word, and I, I, um, I can't accept any money um, yeah. at this yeah. time. But you know what? Both of you, I, I think, have a yeah. very uh, nice mustache. Maybe we should post that up on Facebook and see who gets the most likes. Yeah, there okay, we'll check it out. We'll check <laughs> it out. But, uh, you know, of course, it's in honor of, uh, you know, uh, Brigadier General Robin Knowles, you know, very famous uh, airman of past, 8th uh, uh, Fighter Wing Commander during many conflicts. And so a uh, big shout out to everybody out there that's participating in, in Mustache March. Yes, sir. And, uh, appreciate it. I can't wait till April 1st. I'm not even going to lie. But I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> uh, we also received a, a philosophical question of sorts. Um, it's about etiquette in the base schools. Uh, a person wanted your thoughts on whether it should be mandatory for students in Dodia schools to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag on a military base. Um, he also said it felt simple. It was a simple sign of respect uh, whether or not they are saying the pledge. Yeah, you know, that I appreciate the sentiment that uh, you expressed there, but I have to be a little careful that I don't want people thinking uh, I'm ordering uh, things that I'm not uh, uh, authorized or demanding our children uh, take uh, certain actions. You know, ultimately, the federal court decisions recognize that students, they have a constitutional right to remain seated during the Pledge of Allegiance, and uh, the Supreme Court uh, denied uh, reviewing those. So uh, with uh, DODIA specifically, they don't require students to stand for the pledge. 
uh, but they, they uh, have the daily opportunity to participate in patriotic exercises, such as the reciting of the Pledge of Allegiance and, uh, and saluting the U.S. flag. However, they, they're not to be compelled to participate uh, or if their parents object, uh, so they can decline to do. Uh, you know, they can't be disciplined or stigmatized uh, for participating or abstaining. And so, uh, you know, they have the opportunity to, to respect and not interfere with the respect of others and also respect the customs and flags of all nations if they choose to. And so, uh, you know, I can't really tell them that they have to do that. It's, uh, you know, our federal courts have kind of laid down the law on that one. Yes, sir. Um, we're going to move on to another question. It's a Kadena specific um, about mailing procedures. He said, can we get a change to the post office practice of not issuing boxes to families assigned housing on a base just because the service member works on another base? With service members often being deployed, it is an added burden to the spouses to have to drive across the island, load it down with kids, just to get mail when there's a post office down the road from their assigned housing. That's yeah, so, so uh, th this is an interesting question for me because I, I, I want to start off and say, yeah, I remember. You know, my first assignment here at Yakota, uh, I lived over on the east side, and we had two young children, uh, preschool and kindergarten. And, uh, and so I can remember making the trek to the post office that was on base. So I can imagine, uh, you know, the issue that it is having to trek across the island. So, you know, we did a little bit of checking. Uh, I know how many uh, post office boxes there are. Uh, I haven't talked to General Hecker about it yet. Uh, I think, you know, if I had had this question yesterday or uh, uh, I might have asked him about it last night at dinner, but... Uh, I'll follow up on this one, and it seems, you know, there's probably a compromise uh, between the different services and the different bases as we go down there. And if it's, uh, you know, a capacity issue, uh, we'll get the word out there and, and put it in the future plans to make sure that there's more capacity where the people actually live. Okay, this, this could be an issue also if the spouses are deployed. Now, I understand all that. I, I remember. Certainly, sir. Well, uh, we're going to take a small musical break. We'll be right back with more questions, um, including some about vehicle JCI and, and many more. So stay tuned. All right. Thanks. And we're back here in the AFN Tokyo studio for our Facebook town hall with Lieutenant General Angelella and Chief Laurent. Now, we're kind of strapped for time, so we're not going to be able to get to every question at this moment. But one we definitely want to hit on is um, uh, a Marine down in Okinawa is asking about the gold and silver cards, um, the restrictions. They're very familiar with it. Um, myself being Air Force, I'm not too familiar with it, but um, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So would this liberty policy be realistic implementation for uh, U.S. Forces Japan? Um, or are there any plans for future modifications? Yeah, so, so you know, the first thing I want to say is uh, I, I want to take this question because I didn't want you all out there to think I was avoiding the questions on the liberty policy. <laughs> like I said, the chief and I, you know, we talk about this all the time, and so do the commanders. And, uh, and this is one of the suggestions that a actually has uh, been brought up a few times. We're, we're talking about it. One of the issues in Okinawa, of course, is, is we want, uh, and, and throughout Japan, is we want the, the liberty policy to be consistent across all the services. It's easier to understand, uh, and uh, uh, it's easier for us to explain to our Japanese hosts and, and allies you know, uh, w what kind of uh, rules we're operating under. So, you know, it, it's not over. We're, we're continuing to talk about it. So thanks for asking that question. Talk to your immediate supervisor and your commanders and, and, uh, and the chief and I uh, if you see us out there. All right. And, Chief, do you have any thoughts on that? You know, I just, I just want to close up with uh, a comment about, as the general opened up today, he talked about the, the great work that we were doing and the, the outstanding uh, soldier sales, airmen and Marines that we have, and to thank him for that. And one of the about two weeks ago when I was out doing a visit, I stopped in Yokosuka, and I, I was able to do a tour of the USS McCampbell. And uh, as, I, as we were, I was going through the tour, they were telling me that they were getting ready to go out to sea, and I wasn't sure what it was all about and stuff, and we talked through that. And I just recently found out that the reason they were going out to sea is they were getting ready to do a port visit to Sendai. And part of that port visit was uh, in, in uh, recognition of the 11th, uh, 11th March, the anniversary of the, the third anniversary of the earthquake and tsunami up in, in uh, northern Japan. And so some of those sailors, the shipmates that were on that ship, were also, were also on it at the time that uh, the USS McCampbell was actually the first ship to respond to the, to the tsunami um, up, up in Sendai. So they were going back along with uh, a maritime self-defense force ship to uh, recognize and, and to uh, pay tribute to, uh, 
for that incident. And so um, I just want to thank those sailors and, and everyone who was involved in that uh, operations to Tomodachi and, and uh, the, the response that we pro provided and along with our Japanese uh, counterparts to uh, help out the folks of uh, Japan and um, all of our great service members out there doing phenomenal work. Uh, everywhere I went to during this past visit was just uh, meeting and greeting with some, some phenomenal service members. So thank you, thank you all for your service and thank you for uh, everything that you do. General, we have about three minutes. You have uh, some closing thoughts. Yeah, you know, the, what the chief was talking about, it uh, It really hits home for me. I, just recently, I, about every other week, I have a personal one-on-one -on -one with Admiral Locklear, and, uh, and we talk about uh, upcoming alliance issues, uh, you know, things that we're doing on behalf of our two governments uh, and, and the alliance. And then uh, about once a month, all of the component commanders get together and, and talk uh, by VTC uh, from Hawaii, Japan, Korea, uh, about the great work that our service members are doing here. And, and recently, of course, the chief uh, mentioned the relief effort for, uh, uh, at, Sas at Sasebo or Sendai. And then also, uh, we recently talked about the great success of Operation Damion, uh, led, of course, by the 3 MEF commander and, uh, and supported by all of the services in Japan. And uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have our mid-year update. And I'm just amazed, continually amazed, at all of the great things that our service members are doing, uh, uh, off-duty programs that our families are participating in. Uh, the the rock solid base that we have from our civilians out here, and uh, I'm looking forward to that mid year update with uh, uh, General Carlisle at PACAF, and and I'll tell you the the wing commanders actually are so tuned in with this, and the command chiefs are so tuned in with this, the senior enlisted leaders that they actually will be talking about each other's wings and how they participate together. Just got back from Guam and uh, got a chance to see Cope North Guam. It's not just an Air Force exercise, it's all the services. So, you know, thanks everybody out there for volunteering, for serving your country overseas, some being very far away from home. I really, really appreciate your service. Oh, Lieutenant General Angelo, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, doing this again with you on the uh, 28th. You'll be in here with uh, 374th Airlift Wing Commander, Colonel Mark August. So uh, we look forward to doing that here pretty soon. And we appreciate you and Ch uh, Chief Laurent sitting down with us today, taking the time out of your schedule to do this. And uh, I can't thank you enough. And to our listeners from uh, AFN Tokyo, the Kanto Plain region, AFN Misawa, AFN Sasebo, AFN Iwakuni, and AFN Okinawa, thank you for tuning in today. And uh, we hope we have the pleasure of maybe doing this sometime again, another town hall type thing. Well, yeah, this is the second one, and uh, uh, I'm sure it won't be the last one. I have my public affairs staff sitting over here. <laughs> taking furious notes and I want to thank them also for all the hard work that goes in and uh, again for AFN throughout Japan uh, for getting the word out and uh, thanks again for all your service. Thank you for tuning in today to our special broadcast and we'll now take it back to your regular scheduled program.